He's one of the most discussed people in human history, but there are some things about Jesus that get swept under the rug. These are some of the stranger details about Jesus that practically everyone tries to ignore. Given the long history of Christianity, you'd think there would be a pretty impressive collection of sermons, parables, and stories about Jesus' life. And there are, judging by the closely packed text of the Gospels alone. But while you could get at least a solid year of Sunday school lessons out of all that, the reality is that Jesus probably only preached for about three years. The Gospel of John mentions three specific Passovers, so we know at a minimum Jesus was active for three years. Also, Jesus was a bit of a late bloomer. After what must have been over a decade spent working as a craftsman alongside his earthly adopted father Joseph, he went into the ministry at about the age of 30. This was shortly after he was baptized in the River Jordan by his cousin John the Baptist. Now, while he was hardly considered an old man at this point, he was no fresh-faced whippersnapper either. Considering his importance in human history, you'd think we'd know more basic facts about Jesus, but we still can't even be sure whether he was single or married. Jesus married Mary Magdalene. However, even raising that question may make your resident religious figures blanch. That's because in many churches, the traditional view is that Jesus was not only single, but that he remained celibate for the entirety of his life. Some deviate pretty widely from that view. For instance, early leaders in the Mormon church maintained that Jesus had multiple wives. More recently, the papyrus fragment known as the Gospel of Jesus' Wife contains a mention of Jesus' spouse, but serious doubts have been raised about its authenticity the Gospel of Mary. It specifically says that Jesus loved Mary more than the other disciples. In fact, they actually put that in the mouths of one of the disciples. The uncomfortable reality is that the Gospels neither definitively say Jesus had a wife or that he didn't. That leaves theologians digging for details, like noting the absence of a wife in passages where it would have been a slam dunk to mention her, including Paul's take on marital relationships in 1 Corinthians 7. For some, that's good enough, but for plenty of others, the possibility of a Mrs. Jesus is an open question. To the faithful, it's hard to consider anyone more of a big deal than Jesus. Too bad that wasn't his real name. Well, the book says so, and there ain't nothing written in the book that ain't the truth. The man in question started with the Greek name of Yeshua, a shortened version of Yehoshua. So Yeshua came out as Jesus, the best the Greek writers could manage. Then when English came along, Jesus got translated again, morphing into Jesus. In short, if you could travel back in time to first century Galilee and greet the man himself by name, calling him Jesus would probably be met with a confused stare. What did you call me? The name thing is so awkward that some churches just ignore it altogether. What makes things even more strange and confusing is that there are plenty of Yeshuas in the Bible. It's just that their names were often translated as Isaiah or Joshua. Even the prisoner released by Pontius Pilate in place of Jesus right before the crucifixion was in some accounts named Jesus Barabbas. If I was you, I shouldn't loiter. I'd want to see the back of this place before they change their minds. Step out of your time machine and shout the name Yeshua, and a fair portion of the crowd around Jesus might turn in your direction. While there may be a passing reference or two to Jesus' humble beginnings as a carpenter, the Bible quickly moves on to the whole Messiah thing. Few people focus on Jesus' earliest job and life in his hometown, perhaps because doing so would make him seem less sophisticated. Though it's a bustling city of more than 70,000 people today, Nazareth was considered a remote town in Jesus' time, with a population that topped out around 400. That put him at a serious disadvantage when convincing people to follow him. For instance, according to John 146, a future follower of Jesus, Nathaniel, was initially skeptical of a preaching handyman from next to nowhere, asking, can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? To the faithful, that's downright insulting, but to many of Jesus' contemporaries, it was perfectly reasonable. Oh, and the carpenter thing isn't quite right either. The original Greek version of the Gospels refers to Jesus as a tecton. While many English translations of the Bible interpret this as carpenter, the true meaning is more vague. A tecton could have worked as a carpenter, sure, but also as a stonemason, builder, and general artisan. It may be more accurate to think of Jesus as a general contractor. In Mark chapter 11, a rather odd incident occurs. The day after entering Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus finds that he's hungry and walks up to a fig tree. But when he finds that the tree hasn't produced any fruit, he essentially tells the tree off. Later in the chapter, after Jesus has famously flipped the tables of the moneylenders in the temple, Peter notes that the tree has withered. The incident is also related in Matthew 21, 18 through 22. And in Luke 13, 6 through 9, Jesus urges a farmer to dig up a non-fruiting fig tree. Jesus seems to be in a mood and lashes out at a tree, which isn't committing any obvious wrong by being barren. The lesson, at least according to Mark and Matthew, is that if the disciples have faith, they can do much the same, from cursing reluctant fig trees to flinging mountains into the sea. In fact, Jesus says, And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. 
But thinkers have tussled with this odd story for generations. Some say it's a demonstration of divine judgment, while others think Jesus is coming down on the corrupt temple in Jerusalem. Then there are those who wonder if Jesus was simply tired from his trip. In Mark 5, 1 through 20, Jesus and his group travel into the land of the Gadarenes, where they find a demon-possessed man living amongst tombs. Jesus speaks to the demons inside the man. They say they're called Legion and ask Jesus to send them into a nearby group of pigs. Jesus does just that, and then all 2,000 demon pigs fling themselves off a cliff into the sea. Matthew 8, 28 through 34, which tells much the same story with some small details changed. This time, Jesus is in the land of the Gergesenes and casts demons out of two men. And in Luke 8, 26 through 39, basically echoing the other two versions, this incident happens in Gadarene country and concludes with the Gadarenes becoming frightened by his powers. This man walks through the devil! No! Oh, he's a cheat! A fanatic But why did the pigs have to get involved? The story has long inspired uncomfortable debate as to whether or not Christians ought to care about animal welfare. Augustine of Hippo and Thomas Aquinas concluded that we don't have to worry about being kind to animals, while others place more of the blame on the demons and point to Jesus' parables about good shepherds as a counterbalance. The Bible had some complicated takes on tax collectors. They're hardly beloved figures in the text, but Jesus and some of his associates, like John the Baptist, were known to treat them and their governmental masters with respect. Jesus in particular urged his followers to stay on the right side of the law and pay their taxes. In Matthew 22, 15 through 22, he tells people to render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. But that doesn't mean Jesus wasn't above creative tax pain. When discussing a temple tax that he ought to pay in Matthew 17, 24 through 27, Jesus admits that he doesn't want to do it, but will do it anyway to keep the peace. Then he tells the apostle Peter to go to the sea and start fishing, saying, when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take and give unto them for me and thee." Most readers and scholars think this story means something, but no one's sure exactly what. Sure, Jesus isn't into supporting what he sees as a corrupt religious institution and doesn't want to rock the boat either, but why the coin-spitting fish? Most people just shrug and move on to a less obtuse parable. According to the Gospels, Jesus performed quite a few miracles, from the feeding of the 5,000 with just five loaves of bread and a couple of fish, to raising the dead. He sends it on again, and we catch all these fish. It's a miracle. But what about the times Jesus healed blind people with his own spit? For anyone who needs a reminder, Mark 8, 23 through 25 relates Jesus spitting into a blind man's eyes. The man then reports that he can see again. John 9, 6-7 has Jesus mixing his saliva with some clay, applying the mixture to the blind man's eyes, then telling the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man does, and his vision is restored. I can see! I, I, I am not blind anymore! But what is the true meaning in the spitting? It may have been based on a more widespread Jewish and Roman belief that saliva could help heal people, especially those with vision problems. Spitting may have even helped boost a person's faith, which Jesus maintained was key to actually getting healed just a few verses earlier in Mark 8, 5-13. Many churches hold communion to be one of the most holy rites in Christianity. But the whole sequence at the Last Supper, in which Jesus tells his disciples to eat bread and drink wine while mentioning that they are metaphorically, or not, as many transubstantiation-believing Catholics have it, consuming his own body and blood is a little creepy. This is my body which is given for you. It's due in remembrance of me. Some of Jesus' own followers were so unnerved by his communion statements that they abandoned ship. In John 6, 53-66, Jesus says, So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. But when some of the disciples aren't too keen on the idea, and even though Jesus doubles down on his statement, some of his followers, quote, walked no more with him. This surely has to do with Jewish dietary laws, which today forbid cannibalism except to save lives in the most dire circumstances. As part of a broader concept known as Pequok Nefesh, in which someone must do everything they reasonably can do to save a life. However, John's passage about walked no more with him doesn't specifically refer to those at the Last Supper. So Jesus' words seemingly had a different impact on them than everybody else who heard it in a metaphorical game of telephone. Even a brief scan of the Gospels makes it pretty clear that Jesus was complex. Some passages are not completely clear, even to today's scholars who have toiled over the text for decades. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but Jesus really unnerved the people around him. Take this as an example. 
In Mark 3.21, they are said to go after a preaching Jesus, quote, to lay hold on him, for they said he is beside himself. Even Jesus' own concerned family didn't quite get all his parables. It's all but certain that other people thought there was something really wrong with him, as the high-ranking Pharisees and other members of the Jewish community, who admittedly had an interest in tamping down a religious upstart, likely thought this way too. If you spoke to Jesus, you might agree with them. You have to keep in mind that what we see as basic tenets of Christianity today were brand new or at the very least fringe ideas. In other words, no one was saying the things Jesus was saying. In John 11, 17 through 26, Jesus comforts disciple Martha by saying that her recently deceased brother will live again. She answers that, sure, she believes that he will rise again at the resurrection, to which Jesus replies, I am the resurrection and the life. For many, that's beautiful and affirming. It's also an odd statement for a man to make, as he's not only claiming to be a non-human concept, but a pretty pivotal one at that.